All you activists out there, welcome to our podcast. We are Fast Forward 2030 Lebanon, and we aim to support the implementation of sustainable development goals in Lebanon. For that, we are launching a competition dedicated to social entrepreneurs and non-governmental organizations. Our guest today is Mark Aoun, the founder of Compost Paladi, a decentralized waste management service that recycles and creates viable products such as compost and mulch for agriculture. He is also the founder of Cubex, which is a house scale wastewater and solid waste treatment system. By that achieving a remarkable application of SDG 12, responsible consumption and production, as well as a great contribution to SDGs 11 and nine, sustainable cities and communities and industries, innovation and infrastructure. One man's trash is another man's startup. Mark Aoun, welcome, welcome to our podcast. Uh, hello, Joanna. Uh, very happy to be here. Tell us what motivated you to be an activist and to be engaged in sustainable development goals. Well, um, for Compost Belade, really, it was the, the waste management crisis that started in 2015. Um, I got together with a few other people that have some, some knowledge about the sector and we started work, doing working groups that uh, essentially allowed us to create some ideas that we can suggest to the government and, and things of that sort. We really believe that through gathering our minds, we can have a true impact uh, on a technical level on how to improve things. But of course, the problem wasn't really technical and, and the barriers spread much bigger than just technical uh, capacities to financial, social, uh, and environmental, and so on. Um, okay. During so the, that we... period, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So during that period, um, I I met my co-founder or the founder Antoine Abu Musa, and together we we started Compost Belade as a as a social enterprise uh, with with the support of Fondation Jan, which is an okay. eco citizenship eco citizenship uh, uh, organization. Um, and essentially we started building small household scale boxes to provide people the right awareness and the ability to, to be empowered to address their, their waste rather than having to wait for, for government decisions to, to do so. So that's kind of how we got started for Compost Belade. And a few years down the road, we realized that we needed to complement our work with addressing wastewater treatment solutions as well. And that's when we found the Cubex in 2019. That's great. So, what do you believe are your biggest or your biggest challenges that you had to overcome? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. I think as an entrepreneur, a young entrepreneur especially, there's a, a, a key challenge of credibility that you have to uh, that you have to overcome. And I think that's good. That's good because you don't want anyone with an idea to just come in and uh, misguide the municipality or misguide uh, different entities. So it's understandable that credibility took some time to, to build up. And uh, we really overcame this by, by demonstration sites, by uh, really relying on transparency, by looking at every component that municipalities or different uh, clients were faced with as a problem when they tried to address organic waste or waste in general and made sure we overcome it in the business model and as well as how we provide the service. So uh, I think the... the the key challenge on one side was credibility, but another challenge that I used to find it much bigger of a problem that I find it today was having the right access to capital. Capital is really essential if you're going to build certain infrastructure to collect waste, if you're going to be able to put in your own investment as a company, as you partner with municipalities. Uh, to, to further uh, reassure them of the security of the project, that takes a certain amount of capital. But that being said, uh, I, I grew to realize that with the right project that's well designed, with a good clarification of what the impacts uh, intended are, um, and, and uh, being able to create something that's on the long term financially sustainable, uh, capital becomes less and less of an issue as you, as you get new stakeholders that are interested in, invest in investing in that impact with you. Great. So I want to ask you also about the social, economical, and environmental impact that your businesses have had on Lebanon and still have. Sure, sure. Uh, I mean, that's an interesting question because, you know, if you ask me uh, three years later, uh, is the impact that you've achieved significant? 
I would honestly, with all modesty, say no, it's not. Because we didn't tip the scale of the percentage of waste that's still ending up in landfills. We are recovering a lot of organic waste and tra treating it, whether through the households, whether through municipalities. Today, through Compost Bed, there is over 4,000 tons of organic waste that, that are being processed annually and uh, converted into compost. But that really accounts for less than a percent of how much uh, the country is producing. So, so in that sense of the scale of the impact, uh, it's still at a, at, a, at a shallow level. That being said, because of the contracts we were able to secure last year, uh, by, by 2023, we should be able to serve around 5% of the population. Then you are s talking about significantly tipping the scale. Because when we do uh, uh, impact these, these, these 5%, the impact is actually very deep. Uh, the sense, in the sense, uh, let's look at environmental, economic, and social as, as one. The organic waste, if not disp disposed properly, one is a cost on the municipality and translated as a cost on the user that in a way the municipality is no longer able to spend on other things. On average, so, some municipalities spend around 45% of their, their income on, on, um, on waste management. The second part is organic waste is not ending up in the landfill. And uh, landfills have several impacts. One of them is the liquid leachate that ends up in rivers and groundwater that has an impact on public health, but also on, on the, the environment, of course, and, and uh, the water resource availability. Um, landfills produce, especially because of the presence of organic waste, uh, very high levels of emissions, methane emissions. The uh, methane that, they, uh, that is produced is actually up to 81 times more, uh, uh, causes more of a greenhouse gas effect than CO2. So uh, these emissions are being mitigated uh, as a key component. But then we look at um, <laughs> what, what's in it for, for this end user that's going to use this product, which is usually the farmer or, or the household or whatever that may be. Well, today, because of the, uh, uh, the economic crisis and the devaluation, um, essentially, they have lost about 76% of their purchasing power. And uh, that means agricultural inputs that are predominantly imported today, they are paying a high level on. And of course, this is affecting farmers significantly. By having this local production, we are diverting the need for import of chemical fertilizers. And when we talk about using compost instead of co uh, chemical fertilizers, there's also different economic and, uh, and environmental impact. The most important one is that compost, unlike chemical fertilizers, gives a broad range of nutritional values, not a very narrow range like the NPKs and so forth. So that means we're giving a better nutritional profile for the plants to have the right resilience and also to have better uh, product quality. But in parallel, the compost, uh, unlike chemical fertilizers, not only fertilizes, but also improves the soil structure. So that means the soil can hold water better, it can have better drainage structure, it will promote more biological activity that in turn also creates a more resilient soil, a more uh, resilient farmer, and, and, and a more lucrative uh, production for that farm. So from that end, also the farmer is, is benefiting. And last but not least, nitrogen leaching into the environment, which is when farmers put chemical fertilizers on the ground and in, and in excess, the excess goes into the uh, into the ground into, the, uh, into yeah. the groundwater and to the rivers is actually the leading cause of pollution of the Litani River. So by using compost and promoting this material that is a slow release, we're really mitigating that impact as well uh, on that value chain. This is in general not to account for the fact that compost itself has a carbon sequestration process, so it absorbs carbon from the atmosphere. And of course, the most important one that we're reducing the miles traveled for that material to be processed. Today, uh, all of Mount Lebanon takes its waste to, to very few locations with very far distances traveled that we're also mitigating through this process. So it's really a circular economy that's happening here. In addition to the job creation that happens to operate this value chain that is now, after devaluation, been able to become cash positive. Great. So that's really touching on so many sustainable development goals and, you know, on a great impact on the environment, on water, on the soil, the quality of the soil, on biodiversity. So uh, great. Uh, so really, uh, it's, re it's really remarkable. And also creating a project that is local, so which would cost less and would be a great service to the user 
and also to the municipality because having uh, uh, big environmental problems along the line would cost so much more than to invest in this product. So I want to know more what you think about more opportunities in creating more closed loop systems such as yours, closed loop models that, try, that strives in reusing resources. So what are the untapped treasures that we haven't recovered as a resource from our waste? Yeah, that's a good question because that's gonna be a different answer for different countries, different regions, different business models. At the end of the day, you mentioned something important that you said that uh, investing now uh, rather than having to pay for the environmental degradation later. Well, th that is important. But when we come to the municipalities and the different stakeholders, we never sell this part because they cannot tangibilize it enough. And it won't be enough value proposition for them. It is very important, but it, it, you know, it doesn't show them any cost saving directly. Of course, environmental impact and so forth. So that's why the first thing for any uh, operational model in, re in, in recycling or waste recovery of any sort, you have to recreate the business model side to be able to create something that's viable for you. And it doesn't necessarily mean to make money out of the product that you're selling or recycling the recyclables themselves. Uh, most of the time, the traditional methods don't work. So for example, in our case, initially we could have set up the facilities then charge the municipality per ton but the municipalities are no longer able to, to afford the per ton, so they're not incentivized enough for, to work with us. We re the this scale by making sure that we have purchase contracts for the compost and ensuring that we're able to generate the revenue from the compost that is produced. So the reason I say this is um, the sector, it's not necessarily the type of waste that is new opportunities, although there are some. I would say electronic waste is very interesting as an opportunity because it has a lot of precious materials and is, uh, it has an export potential as well. Um, olive, uh, uh, sorry, waste uh, cooking oil is something currently that's being mass exported. And I think there's a big opportunity to uh, valorize it locally and produce uh, local biodiesel. Before it didn't make economic sense, but today it's much more viable. Um, and, and a lot of industrial waste. So for example, uh, uh, factories that produce yogurt have a byproduct called whey. You might know also that whey is a very famous protein in protein shakes and workouts. Uh, however, you need to process it in a certain way to be able to produce that whey. So looking at industrial streams is very nice because it's large quantities, they're widely accessible, and it's probably good, good uh, easier to make a partnership with that industrialist because it's causing a bigger burden to them than it is on an individual household. So I would look at the different uh, special streams, look at uh, the industrial sectors, and also look at the trading companies, because trading companies have a lot of packaged waste that has, for example, food waste in a package, a KitKat bar or something. Those are very tricky. They're corporate multinationals, so they can pay for their waste disposal. And they have the interest because they have their own uh, corporate initiatives towards, uh, uh, towards the 2030 uh, uh, objective. So uh, the SDGs actually apply to these corporates as well. And uh, that's one good opportunity to jump in and, and, and create a, a recovery system uh, where, where you're still at the smaller uh, scale. Great, great opportunities proposed. So on that tone, I want you to give advice to our emerging entrepreneurs on how they could apply the, this particular SDG, SDG 12 in Lebanon. So what would be your advice to them? Yeah, I mean, um, I would I would say maybe a couple of things that I made I did wrong, and I, I'll give them some advice on that. I think the first step is really don't be afraid to spend time on investigating the problem, because when we understand the pro problem on a shallow level, we're gonna rush to do our favorite thing as scientists and engineers, which is prototype a solution or have a technical answer to the problem, but. But most of the time, I had to go back to the problem again to really get to the bottom of what's, what's causing it to tick and how could it tick differently. So that's the first one. Really, don't be afraid to spend some time understanding that challenge before you go into giving answers. And that's in life, not just entrepreneurship, but take your time to think about the answer. The, the second uh, component, I think, uh, that, that's, that's really something I think I could have done... Uh, uh, slightly better is uh, 
put some more investment into developing a business model that has multiple partners engaged. So as entrepreneurs, we say, you know, I can do it all almost, you know, or I want to do it all at least, or I can be in everything. I want to collect the waste. I want to raise the awareness. I'm going to give the courses. I'm going to sell the compost. I'm going to run the facilities uh, and I'm going to sell the machines to, to do so. You know, that's great. But, and then if somebody tells you, no, you can't do that, then you tell them, but look, this big corporation is doing it. Well, yeah, this big corporation has huge resources to do it. You, you are just starting up and you have Human everything against you. You have, you have everything <laughs> against you. So you really need to focus on one nail and hit that nail repeatedly. This is, Great. this is really the key component to scaling, I think, because when you spread yourself so thin, it's going to take you so much time to scale all these things that your impact, even if you impact in all of them, your impact is going to be uh, compromised. But if you focus on one, that one can go so much bigger and so much more exponential that it's going to outweigh having impact in everything else. So really think of yourself as a cog in a bigger value chain. The more you try to create your own value chain, the less, the more you're going to have public resistance because you're taking away from somebody else's value chain. The more you try to be a cog in a bigger value chain, the more likely you're going to be embraced by partners with open heart and probably are going to find a way to save them some money and create what we call a win-win-win scenario, which is my third advice. If you want something that's an SME, sure, you can do a win-win scenario. But if you want something that's going to become scalable, and have a massive impact, you need to create a win-win-win scenario. That means every stakeholder involved is somehow saving money or benefiting directly from the process. That would be my advice. In your point of view, what is the most important sustainable development goals that is needed to be implemented or addressed in Lebanon? You know, today it's, it's harder to answer because since the economic crisis and the explosion, the priorities probably have shifted, uh, certainly have shifted. Um, you, while we can talk about governance and, and uh, if you want poverty and all these factors, I think, uh, in my opinion, it's, it's really uh, uh, SDG 6, which is related to water and sanitation. Because I, I do believe that uh, the water supply crisis is, uh, is exponentially increasing. It's, it's not only increasing uh, challenges for, uh, for local production and quality and, and safety, but it also is uh, creating community conflicts, actually. And I've seen it create community conflicts with water shortages. Um, that means when water is scarce, People start overusing and it creates conflict among two neighbors. And I think that's, that's something we, we cannot neglect. Um, most importantly, now that um, you know, our country is hit by this economic crisis, we're really going to need to rely on local production. And since we don't have you know, uh, mines or oil or whatever it may be that's currently accessible, we have to rely on our agriculture significantly in this venture of internalizing uh, production. 70% of water consumption is for agriculture. And this is where the biggest shortages come as well. So we cannot neglect uh, water anymore. Uh, dams are not gonna do it, uh, especially not how they are today. It's really about uh, wastewater recovery and improving efficiency in usage because many places in the country we are still relying on some of the most basic methods of irrigation and it is truly a waste okay great that's super that's a great perspective so i also want to ask you if you, how do you believe and do you believe that uh, engaging ordinary citizens such as students, workers, teachers, engineers, doctors, can have a strong leverage point in solving the challenges of sustainable development goals? Um, yeah, I don't know if you... Ordinary citizens uh, is a much bigger pool, I would say, than, than what you suggested. They could be uh, without a university degree. They could be uh, sure. a trade shop owner, a mini mart owner, all of these people. Uh, fall under that, that, that category of regular folks. And maybe the other category is an educated group of people. And I think they have a bigger role 
for sure, uh, because they have better access for information. And, and I think they, they have a bigger duty to access it uh, on the shorter term. Um, but absolutely, I mean, the problem with, with SDGs today as how they are seen, it's, it's seen as a, by a company or by anyone not in the sector and has an in-depth understanding of sustainability, it's seen as a new burden of compliance. Or if it's, it's seen as like, oh, this is a privileged thing. Once the company gets big enough, they can start thinking about it. Or it's seen as, uh, you know, this is regulatory nonsense. Or, you know, why isn't the government doing it for me? Things that people, people don't, you know, you really need to show the public that in, the SDGs were, were set in a way uh, as a metric for us to have direction. You know, how, what do we need to look towards? What can we do? What we can achieve now and what we can achieve later, that's a different question. And how to make that, uh, achieve that. But you really need to get everybody on the general uh mindset of we need to bring in these changes uh in order to really have a a better world to live in essentially this is how holistic the mindset is so mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't mean you should have these as your founding flags but you know that they give you a good direction of uh, uh metric and impact are we going in the right way in, in the sense um and yeah, I think, you know, the more we can invest time in making sure that message is delivered, the more advocates you'll have for integrating SDGs, and the more people can see SDGs as an even cost-saving opportunity, which in many, in many cases, it's, it is the case, you know, it's a long-term uh, cost-saving or even sometimes short-term cost-saving, depending on the improvement of the technology and so forth. Great. So you see that uh, some people or some organizations don't see it as an urgency the urgency that it really represents, I mean, the environmental urgency and the, the quality of life of, uh, of people around the world. So uh, you believe that the biggest obstruction um, in the face of uh, sustainable development goals is money or is it something different? Is it really a ha um, incentivizing people to invest in, in sustainable development goals or could it be a it's different uh, obstruction? Uh, we can't deny the role of money. You know, let's say you want to put solar panels in. This is the most basic concept of, you know, energy efficiency and so forth. Yeah, true. There's a certain capital cost that comes in to be able to put the solar panels. Sure, it has a good return on investment, but at the end of the day, it's a capital that some have and many don't. So uh, there is a cap capital barrier, but that's not to say that the policy of the SDGs as it's designed is capital intensive. It's how we perceive it that is capital intensive because we translate uh, energy efficiency into installing solar panels, whereas it could just mean turning off a light switch that wouldn't cost me anything. In fact, it would save on my power bill or putting, you know, one of the most basic things is, you know, putting different timers on your water heater and things like that, just to start bringing down your, your dead money, money that's being wasted on services you're not using just for, because of lack of efficiency of the infrastructure. So yes, money is a factor, but mindset perception is the main problem. And being well-informed as well, as you mentioned it. Absolutely. Great. So describe the Lebanon you wish to see. Ah, uh, <laughs> you can't ask questions like these in times like these, but I'll try. I'll try. So, um, yeah, I think I think uh, a Lebanon that I would like to see is a Lebanon with uh, transparency in governance. I mean, I, I can't not say it. It's it's really essential, and it's a it's a foundation a foundation to all. But uh, also, I, I want to see uh, a public that is thriving again. And uh, I think a lot of what's been happening to the country, uh, whether politically or, you know, uh, factions and religions, all the things that have brought, come in and separated us, they've separated people. And, and now it's become, there's so many reasons to be separated, even with your closest neighbor, uh, other than having COVID problems. But, uh, the, the harder things become, the more people become soloists or, uh, you know, take care of yourself and your, your family first and then la later everybody comes. 
but but that's that's not going to cut it uh, actually because in fact the, the worse things get the closer we should be uh, standing next to each other because at the end of the day it's impossible to thrive while your neighbor uh, is struggling i mean you can conceptually but at the end of the day when we look at key resources you know you, you can't eat money and you can't uh, cool down the climate with money so you really uh, are sharing a planet you're sharing the water resources if your neighbor doesn't have water treatment and you have you're still gonna drink the polluted water from your neighbor uh, we're in it together i want to thank you mark for your positivity and for inspiring us